most people are too caught up in their own business to care about you. They're not, you know, and there's that, that feeling that you're going to get called out as an imposter. Have you ever been in a meeting where somebody has like stood up and gone, you're an imposter or that guy's an imposter. It does not happen. Hey everybody, this is Jeremy Tears from Tutor Collegiate Strategies, and you're about to check out the latest episode of the Mission of Mission podcast, a show that's designed to help higher ed become better recruiters, communicators, marketers, and managers. Each week, I'll introduce you to an industry leader or difference maker who will share helpful advice, tips, and strategies that will help you grow professionally and personally. Mission of Mission is part of the Enrollify podcast network. I'm excited to share my latest candid conversation, so let's get started. Hey everybody, it's Jeremy Tears, and this is episode 35 of the Mission Admissions Podcast. I love talking to people who are experts at their craft because they've spent a significant amount of time researching, testing, trying and measuring, and today's guest is somebody who has done all of those things in the social media content space, both inside and outside of higher ed, Mr. John Steven Stanzel. Thank you so much, sir, for joining me on the pod today. Thanks, Jeremy. I'm really excited to be here today. So you and I were messaging a few weeks ago uh, on Twitter X. I still call it Twitter. And I saw a post that you made referencing imposter syndrome. And this is something that has come up a lot I'm finding in my conversations lately, especially with middle management. And so I'd just be curious to know, obviously, a lot of people, John, deal with imposter syndrome. What do you think the warning signs are that like, hey, it's coming on or it's coming on again. Any thoughts on that? I, I'm not an imposter syndrome expert, but I, I deal with it. I know people who deal with it. And, you know, it's that feeling when you're you're in a room, in a meeting, you're looking around you and you're like, I don't belong here. I am a phony. I am a fraud. All of my years of experience don't matter. At some point, I'm going to be uncovered. And it's insidious and it's a bad feeling. And I think it's very prevalent in higher ed because generally people who work in higher ed are incredibly smart people who work alongside incredibly smart people with high level degrees. And we're in these meetings of people who are, you know, whether you're faculty or staff there, you're, you're in meetings with very accomplished people from university presidents uh, tenured professors who are very well published and have all sorts of research and, and credentials to their names. And it's very easy to get caught up in this feeling of almost inferiority that I am surrounded by experts. I don't feel like I'm an expert myself. Why am I here? And it's not true. You belong. You, are, you have your job for a reason. You are in the rooms that you are in because somebody saw your value and and you are there. Uh, so it, it's something that I, I think, especially high performing people uh, deal with a lot because the more you know, and the more you are an expert in your field, the more you feel like you you know you know how much you don't know. Do you remember the first time when you felt imposter syndrome? Oh, I, you know. I, I, I'm not sure I know, know the, the first time. I, I can tell you about the latest time and how insidious it was. It, it, it is. It was just like a week ago. That's why, why you reached out to me for this. I posted about it. And it, it strikes at the weirdest times. I, I was having a day. I got an email um, where I was invited to speak at a webinar. And I should have been like ecstatic. Oh, I'm being invited because I'm an expert. They reached out to me, you know. And... But I had the opposite reaction. I was like, oh, I, I don't know if I, I, I'm qualified for this. I, I don't know if I can handle that. And that's where the imposter syndrome, I feel, is like it's most insidious. At, at the point when you should feel most proud of your work and what you've accomplished, you, you're hit with this feeling of, oh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not all that. It's like the opposite of your ego a little bit. Which we want to be modest and we want to be, you know, humble, but imposter syndrome is is just that that nagging feeling telling you that you're not good enough. And that's again not the case. 
So how for you, have you found ways to manage that whenever it ultimately comes up? I think acknowledging it and knowing what it is, is a big part of it to go, okay, I recognize that I'm feeling imposter syndrome to know that everybody else in that room that you're in that, that meeting with, you know, I've had those, those moments when, when I was working in higher ed, you know, I was the social media coordinator on staff and here I am in the room with, you know, the entire C-suite university president. And you've got this feeling of, Oh, I shouldn't be here. Um, most people are too caught up in their own business to care about you. They're not, you know, and there's that, that feeling that you're going to get called out as an imposter. Have you ever been in a meeting where somebody has like stood up and gone, you're an imposter or that guy's an imposter. It does not happen. People are too caught up in their own stuff to be worried about you. And two, they're probably having imposter syndrome themselves. I find that the, the higher people go in the careers, I know this is true for myself, like the worse imposter syndrome gets. That's that's a big part of it. I made that that post on, on Twitter that you, you you brought up. And one reason I, I did that is because I want other people to know I, I have a lot of followers on Twitter. I go and speak at conferences. I do all these things. And I want other people to know that like, even at this level that, that I, I'm, I'm at now, which I'm cringes to like, even like my imposter syndrome hits like talking about my own accomplishments. Like I still have it. So, you know, if you're up and coming home in your career, that's fine. Like everybody gets it. And, and it's kind of normalizing and talking about it. It's like, Hey, yeah, we all, we all have this feeling from time to time. And that, that, that's okay. A lot is happening on social everywhere in this country. I feel like to your point, Instagram comes up with a new feature. It feels like every hour, there's all kinds of other things that TikTok is doing to try to compete with Instagram. At the end of the day, there's a lot of opportunity, I feel like, John Stephen, that higher ed is not capitalizing on in the social space right now. And I'm curious, what do you feel like the biggest opportunity is that most enrollment marketers, either for whatever reason, they know it's there and they're just not doing it, or they really don't realize how impactful it could be in terms of like capitalizing on something in the social media space right now? Social listening, for sure. Hands down. Done well, social listening is like having a superpower. And not, not just monitoring your socials, not just looking at your mentions or doing a search for your school's name, but like doing that deep dive into all the public information that you can find. Um, it's such a wonderful resource. And I think most schools, most enrollment marketers aren't fully taking advantage of it. And not just conversations about your school, but about your competitors, about, you know, what your current students are talking about. It's just all of those things, just, just you know, what, what, what is it that Thoreau says in Walden, like diving deep into the marrow of it? Like just go, go uh, doing that. Um, there's so much value that you can find there. And from there, actually acting upon it and, and using that data uh, to, to make not just changes to your, uh, your social media efforts, but to your you know, your entire university, you know, uh, you, you do the social listening and find out that, you know what, um, man, students love spicy chicken sandwich day in the cafeteria on Wednesday, you know, man. All right. Well, let's, let's make that a, let's just make the spicy chicken sandwich, a regular menu item, or let's feature, you know, let's, uh, let, let, let's let's be sure that when we have our our, our tours uh, for lunch, like we, we serve the spicy chicken sandwich. I, I, I mean, it sounds silly, but those are the sort of sort of insights that sh you may not have that could actually make a little bit of a difference. Social listening, without question, is important. It makes me wonder. Then, okay, we understand Gen Z and Gen Alpha both spend way more time on social, on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube more than they do reading emails and text messages, I would argue in most cases. So then what is the disconnect, John Stephen, in your opinion on so many campuses? Because you've been there and you've lived it, and I'm sure you still talk to people about it. I don't think social listening is something that most enrollment marketers aren't familiar with. So is it a, we need to advocate more for it? Is it a, you know, what is the disconnect as to why more colleges then aren't doing that in your opinion? Oh, there's so many reasons we can get into it from, you know, university admin who 
are dismissive of social media, who don't see the value in it, who think email is more serious than social. Um, I, I once had a university president flat out tell me they did not care about what people said about the school on social media. They only cared about what people took the time to email him about. And I, I like my jaw dropped. So what do you do uh, in a situation like that? To your point where you're just like, this person is either so unself-aware and, or just doesn't want to believe it. Like, how do you show the value then of what you know is there? It depends on the situation as of course, but if you can, you know, show them the data, show them, show them the, not, not and, and the data is important, but also just the anecdotal evidence of like, Hey, here, here's a specific instance where this happened and this is why it helped the school. That can go a long way. When a student posts, hey, I just applied to school X and school Y, I, I can't wait to hear back from them. And then school X replies, hey, yeah, we, if you have any questions, just let us know. And school Y is silent. Or, or school Y replies and you have this battle between two schools in the, the comments. Those sort of things make a difference. And I, if you can't see that, you're, you're kind of stuck in the past a little bit, uh, or, or you're just unwilling to. Uh, another thing is the investment. I, and I, I think this comes down, this isn't just the fault of, we, we love to, to blame admin for, for all of our troubles, but like sometimes it's our fault. You know, you, we're too afraid to ask for the tools we need to do our jobs. Um, so I've left a couple of years ago. I left higher ed. I now work in the entertainment industry. I work on you know, television shows, movies. I, I uh, work on Invincible for Amazon Prime Video. I uh, worked on the Avatar franchise. And when I first started, one of my tasks was to build a, a social media marketing plan for a, a major film franchise. And I came up with all of these ways because I was for just, just fresh out of higher ed. And I was like, okay, we can repurpose this and save money here. And we can do this and save money there. And my boss just, whoa, stop, stop. I'm going to stop you right now. Our client is a major film studio. They have money. <laughs> if they don't want to spend that money, we can pull back the budget. But they will never, and this is, this is the key takeaway I, I want higher ed marketers to remember, they will never know what we are capable of unless we show them. So I I know I know for a fact I've done this in the past of sort of self censoring because of fear of budget of saying like oh I know we don't have the money for this. But you don't know that right? You don't know that maybe there's there's some money tucked away that you know if you really kind of show the whole razzle dazzle and and like this is you know come up with an idea that, that can really do something or show them like how social listening can impact the bottom line of the university. If we only have this tool or we hire, you know, this agency to come help us out with it, they don't know what's out there and what it's capable of. And they won't if you do not let them know. And at the end of the day, the worst they can say is no. And, you know, Maybe you can pull back a little bit. Maybe you get a little bit of funding for, for what you need. Um, but, and it's better than nothing. So, well, and to your point, something like social listening, for example, it's not just impacting recruitment, it's impacting retention and it's impacting your brand and a whole bunch of other things to where, you know, you advocate for something like that and you hope the highest level of leadership understands, okay, this is something that like it's far reaching with its impact. It's not just helping four people in this department who like really want it because it's going to save them a little bit of time or it's going to make their life easier or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. And, and one cool thing about social listening is you never know what you're going to find, right? There might be something going on out there that you're completely unaware of. You know, this is kind of unrelated, but like, I think about this a lot because now I, I deal with a lot of different fandoms of and you know, online influencers and stuff. Right now, there are there, there there is an influencer or web series or something that you have never heard of in your entire life that has millions of fans. <laughs> that's more popular than you can ever imagine. So the same thing applies to your university. There's something going on on your campus that you just, you feel like you're in tune with, but 
you you don't know and you can only do that by by doing that social listening and devoting that time to it hey it's jeremy tears and i want to personally invite you to higher ed's hottest event this summer the engage summit hosted in raleigh north carolina on june 25th and 26th the engage summit is your roadmap for ai readiness in higher education Sessions will focus on cutting edge AI applications that are reshaping student outreach, enhancing staff productivity, and offering deep insights into ROI. This isn't gonna be your typical conference. It's a strategic summit where you'll learn from the best of the best about leveraging AI and digital strategies in higher ed marketing and admissions. Imagine two days filled with hands-on sessions, real success stories, and a chance to network with top minds in the field. You will leave with practical transformative takeaways as you learn how AI fosters a more personalized, efficient approach from recruitment to student success. And here's the best part. The Engage Summit is incredibly affordable. Use the discount code ENROLLIFY50, that's E-N-R-O-L-L-I-F-Y 50, and you can register for just $99. So join your favorite Enrollify network creators at the Engage Summit this June. You can learn more and register at Engage dot element 451.com. We can't wait to see you there. I think of content and I think of a lot of conversations I have around, you know, reading posts and hearing higher ed marketers talk about, God, it's really hard to come up with content. And I sit back and I, I think, all right, if you look at all the data, the data is very clear as to, for example, what prospective students want to see when they go through their college search on social. I want to see what it's like to be a student at your school, but don't show me through the admissions lens, the marketing lens, the president's lens, the faculty lens. Show me through the current student point of view. Why do you think higher ed has been so cautious in terms of the way they proceeded when it comes to doing things like current student vlogs or just showing the current student point of view more on a consistent basis? Like where... Where does that caution come from, John Stephen? Authenticity requires vulnerability, and universities don't do vulnerability very well at all. It's scary. One question I like to ask when I take on a new client is, what about your brand can we make fun of? What is acceptable to you on that? Because sometimes allowing yourself to like, understanding it and, and not hiding your weak points a little bit actually can work out in your favor, you know, for, you know, it, it, and again, it can be a, a very small thing. It doesn't have to be like, Oh, our tuition's really high uh, or something like that. It can be something like well, Texas state university is an example that the university is on a hill. There are stairs everywhere. Like <laughs> there is no not walking uphill. And, and so like, there's a small thing that you can on your social make fun of students talk about it all the time. They, you know, would say, I, I would see on Twitter every day, like every day is leg day at Texas state. Take that as a university, say that, you know, show those things, be willing, let the students say that, um, that, that vulnerability is really, really hard. And I think, especially in a uh, for upper level administration, they the, they don't want to show any imperfection. And I think at this point, you, you kind of have to. You, it humanizes you. It's fine. Um, you know, also like be willing to just, your university isn't just research. It isn't just your university president. And you know, I, I say this all the time when I speak at higher ed conferences, but when I went to university, the only interaction I had with my university president was he was the guy who passed out mashed potatoes right before Thanksgiving in the cafeteria. Like that was his thing. Like, Oh, I, you know, I, I don't even remember his name, <laughs> you know, but I remember the, the lady in the cafeteria who, you know, scanned my card every day, who was super friendly. Like, find those people because those people are the ambassadors of your campus. Every bit is your president. Find the groundskeeper who, rescues baby raccoons on campus, find all of those things to show that day-to-day -day life besides just the, and I don't want to discount, you know, the, the faculty member who's doing groundbreaking, world-changing research, but most students aren't going to interact with them. 
they're going to go and see Miss Susie in the cafeteria every day. And parents care about that too. I think sitting down and having conversations with people, to me, you have to make that part of your weekly schedule at worst, if not your daily schedule. And that's not just for enrollment marketers, but I feel like that's for anybody working on a college campus that's in a front-facing recruitment or retention position. Am I crazy to think that? No. And, you know, I, you know thinking a little bit more about just what, what you say there is that to, to pull from other industries, like, you know, lessons higher ed can learn from the entertainment industry when a studio buys the rights to a new franchise, right? There's a book series, let's say that, okay, this book series is doing gangbusters. We're going to buy the rights to it. We're going to make films, video games, just everything out of it. We, we, you know, what do we do with it? Before a script gets written, before anything gets done, they do social listening and research into the fans of that series. They, you know, get on brand watch, they get on, you know, whatever social listening software, they pull all of the information of like what fans are saying about it, what characters they love, what characters they hate, what sort of details that, you know, they log, they look at like fan art and like log the details of like what, what details in the costumes do, do fans love and that we have to nail that we can't miss when we make this, this film this is what good studios do when they do that. Um, and higher ed can do the same thing with students, right? Do that social listening research. What is it, you know, what, what, what things consistently come up again and again, in student conversation about the school, what, uh, you know, what are they saying? What are their likes and dislikes? You just really have to do that deep dive and be willing to do that and then apply that to your, you know, okay, back back to my chicken sandwich. That I, the spice Wednesday really was spicy chicken sandwich day at my university way back in, you know, 2000. So, you know, how can we, how can we feature this, this thing? You know, we, we sometimes in, 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 film industry is like fan service. How can we do that fan service? Put the thing that the fans like, it, you know, so they, they see it and go, you put the thing in the thing that I love. Um, how, where, where can we find those moments? And that just requires the willingness to like, one, you know, y- yes, movie studios can do focus groups, but by and large, you know, they can't just walk out onto a, like you, you, your, your students are there. Your focus group is there. Just, just, you know, um, take, take the time to listen to them and talk to them. And, um, uh, yeah, you might do the, how do you do fellow kids? But like, don't just assume that everybody is super excited about the new building that's going up or that, you know, the, the new, affle- you know, the new fitness center is the thing everybody wants to see. Um, don't, and, and, you know, we talk about Gen Z and Gen Alpha, like, don't just assume because you saw some study that said Gen Z likes X that that's true. Gen Z is not a monolith, right? They're all different. <laughs> um, so, you know, take the take the time and 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 do the research. Yeah, your students are your number one asset, regardless. I mean, they're there. Why not go utilize them, even if it's just to confirm something you already know or are already thinking about doing, right? Yeah. My, the best, the best advice I got when I was 17 years old and, and, and looking for a university to, to go to, and I think this, this applies, and this is what university marketers need to do. The best advice I ever got was when you go to the university and you go on your campus tour, ask questions to the tour guide, all of that. But when you go to the cafeteria, you'll see some guy dazed out of his mind staring into a bowl of fruit loops stack of books next to him that he's not reading ask him what he thinks of the university uh because he's gonna tell you the truth as university marketers you need to go find that guy staring into his bowl of fruit loops and ask him like yes those, those student ambassadors those student tour guides are amazing students and they're wonderful and they're great and they can give you wonderful insights but go find the guy who's staring into fruit loops too because he's going to tell you some insights that you're not going to hear from anybody else 
What do you think some key metrics are then that marketers either should focus on, should focus on more in terms of like determining an effectiveness of just different social media posts and campaigns? Um, my answer for this is always is kind of a cop out, but all of them, <laughs> all of the metrics, um, give me all of the, all of the data that you can, because each data point, each individual metric from reach to engagement, to follower count, all of those things are one piece of a full story. And if you leave out one piece, you're not getting the, the entire story. So you know, yes, we want to have high engagement rates and we want to, you know, see what, what, what these numbers are doing. And we want to have, you know, look at our follower count, but we have to look at it holistically and get all of the data. Like give me every piece of data you can get me. If, if the, if the social networks start releasing new data points, I am all for it. Like <laughs> the more data you can get the better. So like get the overview and, and I'll, I'll say this for like any, like, admissions directors that are listening or any higher level, when your social media person comes to you and says, oh, our engagement rates up, say, that's good. Give me the rest of the data. <laughs> um, or, or, or not just your social media manager, whatever agency that you've hired that's giving you this data. Say, that's good. Give me the raw data too. And take a look at it for yourself because you, you need every single data point. Yeah, we've never had more data, right? And so utilizing it to make a data-informed decision, I would argue, is something that if you're not doing on a consistent basis, you may not be getting the whole story to your point, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you've grown your personal brand significantly over the past few years. What are some of the things you've done ultimately that you feel like have led to that? Um, to bring it back to imposter syndrome, it's like, what, um, I intentionally, uh, you know, I, I mostly for me, it, it's been consistency, you know, several years ago, I just kind of made it my resolution that I was going to make Twitter a daily habit, um, and, and start posting more. And just every day I was going to do three things. I was going to post one original thought. I was going to respond to somebody else's post and share someone else's. And after about a month, Twitter just became an invaluable resource. And I just started posting more. And like, as I did that, I started to develop a following. I started to develop my own kind of voice. I became, it, it helped me in my own career because I, I, I became a better crafter of post and better writer of copy. But also I kind of had this idea because originally I started as faculty and had this idea of like, publish or perish ingrained into me. So when I became staff, I'm like, hey, why do we not encourage staff to do the same thing? Um, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to speak at conferences. I'm going to share my work. We had faculty members who were, you know, sharing what they did on, on social media. I'm like, well, I'm going to do that too. Uh, so when, when that, that performance review comes up, I can say, hey, look at this, how I'm representing the university. Um, and I, I, I think staff, you know, if they're interested, should be you know, should, should, should do that. Be, be a good, you know, a citizen of your professional community. Uh, and it, it can grow benefits. It can, and make your, grow your career. Uh, when the time came for me to, to move on from higher ed, you know, one thing that happened to me is, you know, I put it out there that I was looking for a new job. And one of my followers said, you know what, you are into comics and you also like you, you, you know, your social media stuff. Um, do you want to come work on this superhero show for Amazon? <laughs> it's like, okay, sure. Yes. Sign me up. Uh, you don't know where it's going to take you. Uh, and, and you can also represent your own university in, in, in many ways. So um, I, I would recommend it to anybody who's interested in just taking the time to do it. But the main thing is it takes time to do and it, you just have to keep at it. You have to know for like the first year or two, you're not going to grow that much, but eventually it, it, it pays off. You, it, and if you enjoy doing it, it's not work. The other thing I found interesting as I was preparing to talk to you today was you've done a lot of journaling over the years. How did that start? And what do you think some of the benefits are for you just in your own journey and growth that journaling has helped you with? Well, for me, I, I, I get these journals that um the company word notebooks puts out and they're just a little one line like there's like three tiny lines like, you can't even write a full sentence a day into the journal it's basically like 
you know, my, my journal entry for today would be like, you know, was on podcast mission admissions. Good day. You know, uh, that that's about it. That's what, all I have room for. But I kind of do it at the end of every day. One, I think it helps with imposter syndrome because I can look back and like, oh, hey, I did all of these things and I had all of these wins and go me. Um, but two, it just kind of helps me like remember what I did that day, especially at the end of the day. I think one thing I used to do was is create um, did list at the end of my day because what I found was I would get to the end of my day and my to-do list would be not done, right? Uh, because I got caught up in emails and other requests and things like that. I, I, I wasn't proactive. I was being reactive to all of the the onslaught of the fire hose of, of things that happened uh, to us all during the day. So I would write down like, okay, this is what I actually did today. And this is where, and I, I would feel better. and like, okay, well, at least I got something done. And the journaling, those little, that kind of bullet journal helps me also like, okay, this is what I did today. I may not have accomplished what I set out to do, but I did accomplish something. Um, so that helps. And bonus points on that idea too, is that when it comes for the performance review, And your boss is like, well, why didn't you meet your quarter two goals or whatever? I'm like, well, these are all the things that I did and all the requests that you made of me (laughs) that kept me from doing the things that I set out to do. So maybe you need to quit asking me to do all of these other things. Um, And I have written proof of that. Um, It it can be pretty helpful too. The last thing we do on every episode is I do something I call fun rapid fire. And so I'm just going to give you a handful of things and I just want some quick takes from you. Okay. All right, let's go. The best board game to play is? Ooh, oh, oh, my, my, my first answer was Monopoly, but no, that is absolutely the worst board game to play because like a Monopoly loss is like a slow, painful death. Um, my family and I are getting into board games right now. Um, I, 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 we, we really are enjoying Cards Against Humanity Family Edition. My, my seven-year-old loves it because he gets to, to, it's not nearly as naughty as the, the adult edition. Uh, but my, my, my kid gets to do a lot of potty talk and he just absolutely loves it. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Your favorite Lego set of all time. What is it? Ooh, um, again, building like, I really like the super Mario Legos. Those are a lot of fun. Um, we, we built the, the Lego Bowser ship, my son and I last year, and it was, it was a ball. Marvel or DC? Depends on what day you ask me. Um, I, I grew up a Marvel person. Uh, I am, I, I think I love the MCU, but it just doesn't hit right without the X-Men um, because that, that's my, my go-to Marvel, like my favorite Marvel stuff. So uh, then the other days, DC. image, I'm going to say image. What's Cop the out. most, what's the most cherished item in your home office there? I know you have guitars on the wall. We were talking about that before we jumped on, but what, what's the most cherished item in your office? Most cherished item in my home office is uh, a paperweight that my father got me when I finished grad school. Last one. Did you buy the Star Wars theme rug for your home office? Because I heard you were thinking about it. Not yet. We just got wood floors installed in our house and um, I'm kind of debating about it. It's a very cool, if you're not aware of it, it's like the company Ruggable makes these and they're very subtle. Like you wouldn't notice it was Star Wars unless you like, you look really closely. And I love the idea of like subtle nerdiness. Um, So I'm still, I'm still thinking about it. I'm kind of debating the colors and everything and whether or not it will actually fit in the room. John, Stephen, I appreciate you coming on and just sharing all kinds of thoughts and, and tips and just suggestions. And hopefully I think it got people thinking just about how they can not only improve some of the things they're already doing, but maybe tackle some things in a different way that they hadn't thought about before. So I appreciate you being so open to sharing. Oh, um, thank you for having me. Hey, all Zach here from Enrollify. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Mission Admissions with Jeremy Tears. If you like this episode, do us a huge favor and hit that follow and subscribe button below. Furthermore, if you've got just two minutes to spare, we would greatly appreciate you leaving a rating and a review of this show on Apple Podcasts. Our podcast network is growing by the month, and we've got a plethora of marketing, admissions, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks that are all designed to empower you to become a better higher ed professional. But Enrollify is far more than just a podcast network. Enrollify is where higher ed comes to learn new marketing skills, discover new products and services, and find their next job. 
We're a growing learning community of 4,000 members, and we'd love to welcome you into the fold. You can access our free blog articles, newsletters, e-courses, and more, or purchase our master course on how to market a university with Terry Flannery at enrollify.org. We look forward to meeting you soon and welcoming you into the community. Again, you can subscribe for free at enrollify.org.